Hello, Gary. Hi, Guy. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very much looking forward to this. Are you? Of course. I can see something in your hand. <laughs> I've got to confess, when we were re- researching this, because as you know, Gary and I fastidiously research all of our, all of our interviews. I'm up in my music room and I was listening to going back to these albums, and I was dancing around, and I had to get the bass out because. <laughs> uh, uh, nice, nice. And, and of course. Well, thanks for coming all this way, Guy. We've got your phone number, haven't we? (laughs) We'll let you know. (laughs) So they're from New Gold Dream, right? They are. What tracks? What tracks? Big Sleep and Glittering Prize. And who played the original? Derek Forbes, who I've got to say is one of my absolute absolute heroes of the age. he was such an influential player uh, but it's not him unfortunately it's not him we got we're doing a big build up here and it's not <laughs> well thank god there's had enough bass players on this show <laughs> yeah. it's the main man himself it's the it's the lead singer of simple minds it is simple minds him and charlie anyway it, yeah it, jim kerr jim kerr who i understand um has got a hotel in taormina in Taormina, which is going to be very boring for everyone else, but I really want to talk because I've actually been to Taormina on holiday twice. And of course, you and I, Gary, have played the fabulous Roman amphitheatre in Taormina. It's a Greco Roman amphitheatre, actually, I think you'll find. I, I, that's what I said. <laughs> uh, that's what I said by the time this is edited. But I mean, listen, Simple Minds, I mean, they just go on and on and on. I mean, 18 albums. And also, can I say that Don't You Forget About Me? which obviously everyone knows as one of the biggest songs of the 80s. If you go on to somewhere like Spotify, at the moment, it's had over half a billion streams. Yeah. I mean, that blows most things out of the water, doesn't it, really? Well, it's one of those absolute epoch-defining things. And uh, and it's funny, isn't it? Because when you listen to it, and actually you can find the demo, can't you, on SoundCloud? Because the thing is, the, the stories that was offered to Brian Ferry originally, it was so clearly written for him. Well, it is, because the guitars were all very Phil Manzanera. It's like Avalon. <laughs> it was written by Keith Forsey and a guy called Stephen Schiff yeah. for the Breakfast Club film. You know, we're going on and on. We're going on and on. We're up. But there's a guy waiting for us in Taormina, I guess, maybe. Probably some blood red orange juice and fabulous pastries. Right, I'm getting my polo shirt on, shorts on. <laughs> Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. This was great, guys. I, I, it's so great to talk to two guys that have done this. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. You know, what people forget about Bowie is that he was such a kind man. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. I know you're musicians, but you've been more professional than a lot of journalists. Remember me? I'm in a band now. It's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. Get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Jim! How you doing, mate? I can't complain. You know why I can't complain? I've just been eating strawberries, and I love strawberries. Are you in Taormina? I'm usually in Taormina, Gary, and I know you know that, that place. I was there until a couple of days ago. I'm now just outside of Nice for my sins. But normally I am in Tormina. Your sins are clearly very slight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, yeah, because Tormina, yes. sorry, Jim, if I just may say, because obviously Gary and I played the fabulous Greco Roman amphitheatre. I've been there on a holiday twice. It's one of my favourite places in the world. It's the only place I've ever ordered shoes and had them made and sent to me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's my favourite shoe shop in the world. But unfortunately, the, the stiletto broke, didn't it, in the first week? I can't afford the shoes in Tormina. Been a Scotsman expensive. and all that. Yeah. <laughs> you have a hotel there, right? How did that all happen, Jim? Okay, short version. Just like you guys, we went to play in Sicily, but it wasn't Tormina. We went in 1981. And at that time... Um, very few bands went to Sicily then, you know, it was all the, the stories about the the mafia would steal your equipment and you would get robbed and all oh, that yeah. stuff. And and anyway, we went down and had a ball. 
And the next day just happened to be my my birthday. We come over on the boat to Messina, which is the, the port there. And someone said, we're going to go to this place called Tormina for lunch. And um, it just felt right because it so happens that my my birthday is the same as the sort of patron saint day. So as well as having a beautiful lunch in the restaurant, there was fireworks going off and all sort of stuff. And I thought, something about this place. And then I, I asked about the saint as well. And he said, well, he's, you know, he's the saint of travelers. And, this, and I thought, this is all adding up. Anyway, we had a ball. There was a woman involved inevitably. And um, <laughs> I ended up going back there a lot and it becoming, you know, not quite a home from home, but I got to know everybody and I'd play football with the guys and all that stuff. And then kind of the run about the millennium time where things were looking a bit backs against the wall for simple minds and um, things were looking a bit backs against the wall for me as well. <laughs> My second divorce and all that, I thought, I've always wanted to go to Tormina. I've always wanted to learn Italian. I don't know what I'm going to do this next year. I'm going to have a kind of um, a sabbatical and try and work out what's what. And lo and behold, well, 22 years later, both Charlie Burchill, who I'm sure we'll be talking about in this interview, we both took... Uh, full Italian residence a couple of years ago. And, and it's so it, it's not only home from home, it's actually home now. Oh, I had no idea. That's extraordinary. Wow. You've had a, a new single out, which is it actually isn't a new single, right? It's one that you wrote 40 years ago, Jim, but you've recorded now. You waited a long time to get it together. And, if, and the artwork for it looks like it's from 1978 as well, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's quite a cute story. I mean, a lot, you know, a lot of people go back and, and re revisit and reimagine and remake and remodel songs, but and we're really pleased with this. I mean, I know everyone always says it, but we're really pleased. I think it, it shouldn't sound as energetic and as up and as full of life as it does, especially with us being at this kind of a vintage age. But the story was that the song we've just released that you mentioned, Act of Love, it wasn't the first song we wrote with Simple Minds, but it was probably in the first three or four. But it was the first song we ever played live. And so, you know, Simple Minds' first ever gig, which was January 1978. It was, um, they called them discotheques in those days. Yeah. Which one was it? Which one was it? It was called Satellite to City, which was kind of, you, you, it was a, a ballroom above the old Green's Apollo ballroom. And we were third on the bill, top of the bill was, um, what do you call them again? Steel Pulse. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow, great. It was the first time we'd ever seen Rastas in Glasgow. We, we, <laughs> we don't have a West Indian community. So that blew my mind for a start. Well, actually, no, I'm wrong. I'd saw Bob Marley, but it was it was the first time. The thing is with Steel Pulse is they were really embraced by the whole punk new wave scene, weren't they? They did a lot of those same shows. They were indeed. And the second band on the bill, the second top line was a band called the New Sonics, who then went on to become Orange Juice. Oh, yeah. wow. And we walked on fresh from a glorious six months being in a band called Johnny and the Self Abusers. <laughs> Been all downhill since then. <laughs> we, um, you know, cobbled together this thing called Simple Minds, rehearsed night and day for about two months and had our first gig. So we walked on to the sound of our own feet. And the first song we had was this song. <laughs> Great, well put. Which is better than the sound of broken glass, which has happened sometimes as well, <laughs> yeah. as you guys will know. But anyway, with this song called Act of Love, and Charlie came up with this riff that I thought it was the greatest thing ever. And, and you know then, when no one knows your stuff, it's so important from the first, well, it's still important. Mm -hmm. It's just so important for the first song that you get the crowd on your side because then your confidence grows. And for about a year, this Act of Love song was our banner song. It was our haka. And usually it won the audience over, lo and behold, a year later the time we had um, actually managed to secure a record deal and we're making our first album. The band being so prolific and stuff, poor old act of love got shunted to the side. Yeah. But there was always this thing about this riff. And so a few months, well, actually this time last year, well, we began working on 
what will be our next record. It's always fun to mess around, you know. It's like sometimes it's very intense making a record. I'm sure you guys know. You say, let's do a cover or let's mm-hmm. go back and check out an old idea and, you know, see if there's any lost treasures there. Well, Act of Love popped up. Charlie played the riff and I thought, we got to do this. So we went back and we, we strapped a few more engines onto it. We wrote a much better kind of chorus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we have this song that spans 44 years or, or whatever, yeah. Wow, because you had such a big shift so quickly, didn't you? Because you went from being very, very guitar-y to kind of this fabulous electronic. Was that really considered or was it sort of an organic thing? It's called the advent of cheap synthesizers, <laughs> guy. <laughs> suddenly, because as you guys will know, it suddenly, you know, the year before, you know, synthesizers were the size of fridges yeah. and you needed men in white coats. To sell. <laughs> and then suddenly, well, in our case, we started the band, you're right, and it was um, it was very much a kind of a new wave type thing. But um, Charlie Burch's girlfriend, talking to her workmate, and she said, oh, my boyfriend's in a band. What does he play? She says, he plays this thing called a synthesizer. Charlie told me, I said, there's no one in Glasgow with a synthesizer. There's no one. <laughs> he said, like, no, no. And I said, like, but like a synthesizer like Hawkwind or a synthesizer <laughs> like Giorgio Moroder. <laughs> and he says, a synth, a synth, you know, you, you, you know it all depends on the geezer. I said, we've got to go and check out this guy. Where is he playing? And um, his name was Michael Mc- McNeil. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Mick was playing in a Chinese restaurant in Kilmarnock Road <laughs> and we went down and <laughs> how could I say Mick, Mick <laughs> he was an odd character Mick, he still is traditionally he's an islander he's from Barra so he was brought up with accordion music he's an amazing accordion <laughs> uh, reels and jigs but um, a few joints later thought I better get my hands on a synthesizer and so he had this <laughs> and was playing in this sort of talk dirty band and uh and I mean this, we had to harangue him to join us. You know, he just didn't know what we're talking Cause, about. Because in those days, you couldn't play chords on synthesizers. So it wasn't like he was playing pop songs on synthesizers. It was a yeah. one-note instrument, wasn't it? Well, he did have um, a forfisa in that as well. Uh, oh, right, 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 and right, right, he did right, have two right. hands. I think what Guy's touching on as well, it's interesting the route that you you came from because I can hear you know I mean I, I had another look at your old grey whistle test Chelsea girl appearance which I remember I watching when I was 18 and the sort of bands that you fit into in this sort of post-punk world are sort of Susie and Magazine and obviously elements of Bowie from Berlin and television and Talking Heads. There's definitely an American sound in there, isn't there, that was inspiring you? That's right. I mean, television, Talking Heads, scene Patty Smith. But as well, you know, and I have to say this to you, gentlemen, I'm a big fan of the, the podcast, as is Charlie oh. Burchill. We, we oh, listen wow. to them all. And I noticed... Through the years, you know, when you, I don't think we've ever had the chance to play together or anything, but, you know, whenever I met contemporaries, bands of our generation, and you get talking to the individuals involved, and um, more often than not, people our our age, you realise if they'd been in my class at school, we'd have been in the same band, because... You know, I mean, I could list the the long list of people you've spoken to, but um, my favourites, I've got to mention Jean-Jacques Burnell, because if I don't, he'll punch my head in. And (laughs) and, um, We keep him at Zoom length, okay? (laughs) (laughs) I'm actually meeting him for lunch very soon. (laughs) Of course he's down there, of course. Send him our best. Yeah, I will. It's about time he paid as well, but I'll just put that in. The first gig I saw, I know you will love this, especially you, Gary. The first uh, time I heard live music come out of PA, was watching the skies with Foxtrot. Wow, wow. (laughs) That was the first gig I ever saw. And you say that it blew my mind is, um, it's really not an exaggeration. But um, I forget what your question was. Well, we were talking about the root, the the things that were turning you on as a band, you know, the sort of influences. Art rock, rock, see, I mean, art rock, I still think, I mean, you know, yeah, you might not call Belfast Child art rock, but I see that as a diversion. I still see Simple Minds coming from an, an art rock. We still reference Bowie. We still reference Roxy. We still reference the first Ultravox albums. John Fox, yeah. Really, the prototype when we came through 
magazine, you know, I mean, yes. that post-punk. Yeah there's, yeah, there's a lot of that in Charlie's early stuff, yeah. Exactly, that John, genius. John McGeoch. The McGeoch, genius, genius, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were ahead of your time. I mean, in the, you know, we all think down in London, we're the coolest, you know, and the Blitz Club has become extraordinarily famous. And of course, we only ever admit that we were dancing to craft work. And, but Changeling was a massive track in the Blitz in 19... 19- 78, 79. In fact, I just want to jump in here, Jim, to say when we, we interviewed Simon Le Bon, what was interesting is that they were both, Simon and Gary were talking about this, there was one song, what was it? And Simon said, Changeling. And both of them went, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah, yeah. It was clearly such a big part of Blitz and Rum Runner. And then with Empire and Dance and Travel and Celebrate, Travel was a big, big, Rusty would spin that in that club, you know, and you were way, way ahead of a lot of bands. I think it was you and Human League, I would I'd say, were the, definitely at the Vanguard. Forefront, Vanguard, this, yeah, it's the same thing. I tell you a story about that. Was, it, it's really nice that you, you mentioned that. And, and when I talk about the music, it's simple. I mean, sometimes it might sound that I'm being arrogant, but I don't think I'm being arrogant because I don't write the music. I'm a fan of the music. I'm, but Mick McNeil, Derek Forbes, Charlie Burchill, everyone in the band just now, not being a musician, to me, it's all still magic. So if I get over excited about talking about it is music after all. It isn't poetry. Um, so if I got overexcited about that, I mean, Changeling is an incredible riff and the bass line and all that. But this is where I'm going to put it back to you, where um, yourselves and Duran Duran both done us a huge favour and cost us a fortune. <laughs> and I'll string this together quickly. Jim, is this going to end in a postal order being sent to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, tell, no, I just think it's credit where credit's due. Okay, go on. So you mentioned Empires and Dance, but that time we put out three albums in a very short space of time. And although the reviews were getting better each time, and although every time we turned up to play live, the crowds were getting bigger. There wasn't any chart success. And so three albums in, a record label at the time, Arista, the debt was mounting up. I mean, of course, it was amazing then. You could even get three albums. Now you'd be out in your neck after. Well, you wouldn't even get it in the door now. But anyway, you know, the debt was really mounting up. And we thought they're going to um, terminate, you know, so we're going to be without a deal but we'd heard through the grapevine at Virgin, who were a really cool label, we'd heard a couple of people there were really, really interested, and we thought, we'll just keep quiet. They'll kick us off the label. We'll get rid of the debt, and then Virgin will come in, and it'll be um, a blank canvas. And that was all gone to plan until this thing called blitz and new romantics came along and you remember that the sons had a futurist chart oh god yes yeah, right of course so of course the way record companies worked in we yourselves and duran duran you know creating that whole thing and of course credit to rusty as well he was such a champion of our, our stuff suddenly every record label was saying we get any old crap on our label that could maybe fit into this futurist thing. <laughs> and so suddenly Arista were like, eh, well, I think we've got something here that might fit that. You know, Simple Minds seem to be included with these um, incredibly fashionable bands. And, you know, cutting it short now, they did let us go, but they said, you're not going without paying this back. And so Virgin <laughs> were keen on us, but everything Virgin gave us we had to pay to, um, so... Um, Ouch! Exactly. The debt, we thought, great, you know, we're, but Virgin just picked up yeah. the debt. But listen, we couldn't complain. It all went great. They were a brilliant label for us. And sometimes, you know, sometimes the timing really, well, it's not just the idea, it's the timing. I was just going to say, was it going to Virgin that brought you to Peter Gabriel's attention? No, that was a bit earlier. Um, oh, okay. Empires and Dance had come out. We were playing the marquee, and I think uh, Genesis or Peter's Manager was in Wardour Street or around there. Gail Colson. Exactly, and 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 um, I remember Peter coming in, and and um, I remember someone telling me Peter was there, and you know, 
I always hate knowing anyone's there because you just go on. You just go, I still hear it. Yeah. I hate it. <laughs> um, Horrible. Because when you know there's someone you know in the audience, you just envisage them there. It's like you're doing a one man show to them, isn't it? That's you right, hear yeah. it through their ears. Are you? Yeah. And of course, you know, when it's your heroes, when it's your idols, and it's overwhelming. But anyway, Peter came in, and before we knew it, I mean, as I, as I said, although we weren't getting hits, although we weren't getting on. If you weren't on Radio 1 during the day, that was that. If you weren't on Top of the Pops, that was that. But I suppose we really were the old school way. We, we were allowed to be the old school way, and we were the old school way because all we did was play, you know. And, you know, at the Germany, Holland, Denmark, whatever, we just went out and played. And, you know, <laughs> winning 15, 20 fans a night, but... More importantly, realise that now we were getting really good uh, at what we did live. And at the end of the day, all these years later, that has been the thing, probably more than anything, that's um, enabled us to keep putting bread on the table. You've always been great live. You supported Peter, didn't you? you, yeah. Did you go? yeah, that was an amazing education. Uh, Peter, on that great, you know, um, you know, all the albums all had the same title, but the third one, The Games Without Frontiers. and Melt, as they call it, yeah. Melt, yeah. I mean, really amazing album. And, and so for me, um, that was another thing, you know, you, you find out if you have the stomach for it all because we... We got a lot of stick on that too, because even Peter then, a lot of Genesis fans were still coming to the gigs and, you know, wanting to hear Lamb Lies Down on Broadway and stuff. And Peter had, let's call it, a much more new wave dimension then. Mm -hmm. And he was even getting some stick. <laughs> but we were getting murdered most nights. And yet, I travel, celebrate and all that. You're hearing it coming out, that big PA mm -hmm. and everything. I thought, We'll be back. And and also learning from Peter as well. It was arenas. And yeah, how can I say this? He was, he showed how you could be really successful, but still have, um, yeah, a humility. And that was a great thing to see. Talking of supports, Jim, because you had a reciprocal thing, did you not, with an Australian band? I don't know if they were still called Flowers then, where they supported you over here and you supported them in Australia. Yeah, guy, and I know you you played when they were great. Yeah, I joined just after, and they were, and Ivor was just such a huge fan to the point, actually, that the, the first album I did with them, we had a couple of songs which were so simple mindsy sounding. I was thinking, well, I don't know what you're going to think about this. Well, I mean, we were all from the same, you know, there were such Roxy fans and all that yeah. as well. And yeah, they were amazing because that was like a student exchange. Again, <laughs> I think we were one of the first you know, of our generation of bands to be able to go to Australia. And it was thanks to them because um, they were great champions of the band and they took us down there and we got to open for them. And similarly, they came here. But uh, Australia was the first place where we actually did things. Maybe we could be an art rock band, but also have hits because they had this great um, radio in Australia. It was almost like a pirate radio, but it was huge. And, you know, no playlisting and stuff. So alternative radio. Songs, when we went down there amongst the kids, songs like Love Song and The American and all that stuff that weren't hits in the UK were kind of perceived as hits there. We thought we would go on, you know, the typical opening act, but people were already jumping up and down. And I thought... <laughs> The Scots diaspora in Australia probably okay. something to do with that as well. <laughs> that was a kind of oxygen we needed. Because the first time I ever saw you was at the Coogee Bay Hotel, because there was that fantastic thing in Australia that even when you got big, you were still playing what was essentially pubs, but they held thousands of people. And it was mental. It was such a great show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I loved those. Yeah, it was called the pub. You're right. It was, it was really big uh, hotel rooms, wasn't it? Yeah. And it was like hotel ballrooms. Before going down there, Australian bands, we got to hear a lot more about them subsequently. But at that time, there weren't really so many. And I remember going down a few nights and, you know, they wanted us to go and see the angels and chisel. Oh, yeah. like, the chis, yeah. I have to say, we were like, what's this crap? Everything was meat and two veg rock and roll, wasn't it? Yeah. Exactly. And let's go and see NXS. It can't be that good and all that. And you would be like, jeez, you know, I mean, because those <laughs> bands played every single night yeah. and they could all play like hell. Uh, it was so impressive. So that pub scene, it's pretty funny because I, I remember this. 
then traveling to Australia, the cheapest way was a one-way ticket. <laughs> anyway, we turned on the street. It took about two days to get there. Arrived, and although I've just said we were one of the first, arrived and we thought, wow, one of our nemesis are playing tonight, Echo and the Bunnyman are uh-huh. playing, and we we went over on the ferry to Manly to see them, because someone said it was a pub gig, but it was like 2,000 people, and they were absolutely brilliant. And uh, we met Mac. Up until then, Mac had slagged us to death and all that. We met him. Couldn't have been nice. He slagged everyone. A week later, back slagging us again. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> He's still doing it. Don't worry. Yeah. 40 yeah. years later, still slagging us. <laughs> <laughs> they were just great. You know, Guy mentioned you inspiring Ice House, but there's more than that. I mean, you know, James from uh, The Manix says that Empire and Dance is one of his favourite albums of all time. I've already mentioned how you inspired us at the Blitz Club. New Order, I don't think, would have ended up like that. Although, you, you obviously owe some stuff to Joy Division initially, I think. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I but, mean, that's the story with our first album. Uh, I mean, we were kind of spoiled with our first record. And, of course, being kids and never having made a record and all that, it's such a learning experience. And I'll, I'll tell you how overwhelmed it was and how I ended up wanting to scrap the thing a week after it was made was that we worked with is a great great producer legendary john lecky yeah abs- yes and with the budget from arista and he thought i know what, what to do here these guys aren't used I mean, we'd only been in london a few times i'd hitchhike down my mate was in london i would hitchhike down to see the odd gig charlie and i hitchhiked down to see ultravox at the marquee wire all that stuff anyway john thought We'll go to a kind of farmyard place. There used to be, you know, residential studios. We Later on, it was Rockfield, but there used to be one. can't remember what it was, but John said, this is what we're going to do. We'll do the backing tracks, some guy at a farmyard on a barn, and we'll bring the Rolling Stones mobile. We'll do the backing tracks, and then we'll go to Abbey Road for 10 days. I mean, you, you can imagine it was. It was beyond. Um, so we came down and it was great. We got to stay and we did the backing tracks. Then we got to Abbey Road. Now, you think, who's not going to love that? I completely froze. It was too much. Uh, it would be like, I know you're football fans and all that. It would be like your first game being at Wembley Stadium. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was like, John, what the fuck are you playing at? We'd only ever spent six hours doing a demo in a basement in Glasgow. That was the only <laughs> studio we'd, we'd ever been in. Although I have to say, not all the band felt that way. Derek Forbes, our bass player, was like, the Beatles, bring it on. <laughs> Queen, bring it on. <laughs> Can I say, Derek played like that as well. He was just great. You know, he'd be like, um, I was trying to block it out, but he would be like, Oh, yeah, they used that on Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, you know, pointing to some microphone. (laughs) Don't tell me that. You know, you take the long, a singer anyway, you take the long, lonely walk to the microphone. (laughs) (laughs) I see that as the penalty walk, you know, especially with Simple Minds. These these great backing tracks, it was like, you're in, mate, you're next. (laughs) Let's hear what you're going to do with this. Because we didn't really write songs. We wrote jams and I kind of did my thing over it and then we edited things and all that. But, you know, there were great, great backing tracks and, and it was like, oh, God. But anyway, I couldn't stand the Abbey Road thing. We were there recently. It, it was fantastic. But back then, it was too much. Um, um, God, I keep going down alleyways here and forgetting. That's how we like it. It's perfect. You're a dream guest, mate. This is just, just wonder, wonder. We mentioned Joy Division briefly. Uh, you mentioned, well, great. Well, well here's this. Sure, so we did the album. And, and the stuff coming out, the, the speakers, you know, it sounded great. Because the first time we really heard ourselves and John Lecky and engineers and townhouse studios and Abbey Road, it sounded great. But even then, I had this notion of something's not right about this. But never having made a record, none of us, I couldn't articulate what it was. Anyway... <laughs> A few days after the the album's finished, and yeah, the record company's in listening to it. Oh, it sounds great, it's, you know. And what it did, it sounded pro. It sounded professional. But a lot of the songs, having played them for a year and a half, we were bored with them. It didn't feel as good as uh, the demo that got us the, the deal. The demos are full of vitality, and and there was an edge to them and all that stuff. But I, 
I had kind of forgotten all that until as we were about to jump in the van from the townhouse studios all the way back up to Glasgow, someone said, oh, you want to hear this band called Joy Division? Here's a cassette, listen to it on the way. I listened to the way home, I thought, we've screwed it. This is where it's at. This, what have we done? You know, we sound like he'll kill me if he hears this. We sound like the Boomtown Rats. We're not the Boomtown Rats. Um, um, <laughs> Your Boomtown Rats are great, but we come from the Velvet Underground, and we come from magazine and television. It was yeah. it was just too poppy for me. The balance was wrong. Yeah, I I didn't know that. I couldn't uh, articulate that. So um, got home <laughs> to my mum's house, called my manager, and said, "You know, we're not putting." He was like, "What are you talking about? You're not putting it out." <laughs> Of course it's gone out. But after hearing uh, Joy Division, where they probably made theirs for two bob with uh, Martin Hannett. Martin Hannett, yeah. There was an edge to Simple Minds, but for me it wasn't um, it wasn't present on the but, first album. Jim, that begs the question, when was the moment you felt in a studio or when you sat in the room and it was played back through the speakers, that's it. That doesn't sound like anyone else. That sounds like the super group we mm -hmm. want to be. I still hear all our influences and we wear them proudly, but I think with New Gold Dream, which was the fifth album, you know that thing where you take your influences and you grow your own thing out of them? I think by New Gold Dream, the balances were all right. I thought this sounds like Simple Minds and mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's still coming from Roxy, it's still coming from Bowie, it's still, there's even, you know, instrumental tracks, a bit of prog rock there, all that stuff. But I think, Putting it together, by that time, we had established this um, Simple Minds identity. Yeah. I think that's where yeah. everything was in the right place on that, that album. And, you know, subsequently, all the years later, it wasn't the most commercial selling record, but people still look at it as being the, the sort of landmark album. It absolutely is. I still remember where I was when I first heard it. And I've got to say, as a bass player absolutely epoch defining record Derek on that album yeah he's great it's, it's great just, but it was interesting you were saying Jim how you basically write from jams you had a band which had three incredible riff writers in it it was like you had three Keith Richards <laughs> Derek's a guitar player he was a guitar player that stood in playing bass for a band called oh, don't The say Subs that. in Glasgow. No, he, he, he stood in for a guy. And we saw him and we thought, he's incredible. And that was a tough one because we had to sack one of our best mates. You know, that was, you know, these things you learn as you go. Yeah. People mm -hmm. don't really think we wait to sack really one of our best mates to um, do that. But once we saw Derek, our ambition was really growing. Once we saw Derek, he wrote melodies, he wrote top lines. Yeah. Mick McNeil. Um, yeah, the, the interplay between Derek and Mick is amazing. Yeah. And then Charlie. So, it, But the thing was, but unlike you, Gary, there was no songwriter. There was no one really, apart from the first album where Charlie and I sat in our houses and work stuff out. Other than that, there was never anyone who came in and said, all right, I've got a song. What would happen was we'd be touring so much and then we'd get three weeks free of touring and we would go to a residential place where we could plug in and play night and day. And it was really coming from jams because uh, the guys just loved to play. And, and, you know, a lot of that kraut rock stuff where it wasn't really mm -hmm. songs, yeah. it was... Um, now it was more like loops and then kind of hypnotic thing and then a chord would change. It would feel like the whole world had moved. That's it. You know, that's it. Chip, there's one of the songs which has just got one note bass playing throughout the whole thing. A waterfront, isn't it? I mean, it's just like, that's it. <laughs> you don't hear any similarities with that with any Pink Floyd song? Okay, Jim, well, yes. I'm going to tell you now, right, that actually on the 1994 Pink Floyd tour, when we were playing one of these days, which is clearly what we're referring to, when it got to the end, when it was all bells and whistles, Gary Wallace and I would play Waterfront. I would actually throw that chord. At, yeah, gang, 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 gang. I know gang, that, gang, and I love gang, you for gang. it. Oh, that's great. And also <laughs> on on the uh, Nick Mason's Also of Secrets tour we've been doing, we do an old song, "Let There Be More Light," and at the end, guy goes into. I was actually playing Big Sleep. Do 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 do. Gary, you'll know this. I don't think you'll know the song, but 
hardcore simple minds really but the first song on our sons and fascination album yeah dun, 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 i'm sure derek i mean I've, I've never asked him of course but i'm sure derek had been listening to apocalypse in nine eight the genesis track on on uh, supper's ready oh, yeah. it, of course it is yes <laughs> <laughs> it's that same but don't tell anyone though which is Mike Rutherford Mike Rutherford yeah and I loved your interviews with Mike and um, the more recent one with Steve Hackett um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. so you know people would jam things they like and you know if you just move it a little bit um, but Jim Jim, Jim s- certain things happen with New Gold Dream I mean Mel comes in and plays drums Mel yeah. Gaynor I mean what a difference that was and Peter Walsh made the most exquisite production sound. I know he did Penthouse and Pavements before then. And I looked him up yesterday and I had no idea. It says, first thing it says, he worked with Spandau Ballet. And I can't remember that. He must have been a, an engineer and tape op at some point. It's going to break his heart if he hears that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's, but, he's a great, great guy. He just, did that, that Scott Walker stuff as well. That's yeah. right, yeah. But let's just talk about Mel, because what happens here is, there's two things. Obviously, this is a great moment because Mel's such an exquisite, brilliant drummer. So you have this extraordinary rhythm section. But you're sort of not a band. You're not those same kids from Mm Glass. It's focusing more on you and Charlie. And there's a core. Yeah. Well, I tell you, you know, the thing of come the moment, come the man. Um, The great thing about Mel, well, he had both the rock thing. He had the Zeppelin thing, but he also had the groove, you know, he also coming from another culture. So we thought, oh, this is great. Not only can we rock, but you know, Simple Minds can groove as well now. So that was a great thing. But more importantly, um, the guy that was working with us in New York, the chain, he just, um, how can I say this? By uh, Some people freeze in the studio. I was talking about me earlier being in Abbey Road and stuff. Some great players just freeze in the studio, and Mm -hmm. and we had it a couple of times. So a couple of weeks in with a recording, New Gold Dream, we we didn't have much down and panic stations. And um, Pete said, look, there's this kid. um, Shall we get him in and see what's what? And before we knew it, Mel turned up. I always remember. He looked more like then the boxer John Conte, the moustache and the hair, and he was wearing a blue and white rugby shirt and stuff. Anyway, in terms of Simple Minds, the rest is history. But what was really great about it was he gave Simple Minds this weight. Just at the time, I was talking earlier about how although we didn't have hits in Europe, but because we played live, the followings were getting bigger and bigger. And we were getting... You know, the whole festival circuit in Europe, this is before Glastonbury became trendy and popular and all that. And we were finding ourselves third or fourth on the bill. And I was thinking, it was great and all that, but I was thinking, how do you really make these big places work? You go from a pub to a club to, you. you if you're a live act, the clues in the word act, how do you... <laughs> get it to work because I mean I would watch how, and again how can I say this I'd watch real legends and they were brilliant or we'd find ourselves Costello would be on the bill or Van Morrison would be on these you know 60 70,000 and it wasn't really going beyond the first few rows it was a different right. kind of music well, and I thought if we're going to find ourselves in these places we better have a sound that can work I mean to be honest Sometimes we're trying a bit too hard, but you've got to go through. You, it's a learning process, but we needed to toughen up the sound. We needed to... I was going to say, Mel is someone who was born to play arenas, and that's clearly where you were going, you know, so... That's right. So, again, you know, um, that was a stroke of fortune. You know, you had so many key songs that represent times during that decade, but Promise You a Miracle was definitely... You know, in a way, I think that title as well, thinking about it right now, you know, Promised You a Miracle seemed to have that sense of aspiration that that decade wanted to embrace. It had, you know, that the great synth pads, wide cinematic sounds that, you know, do you remember that song suddenly appearing? Doesn't the riff come from some funk tune that was someone oh, was yeah. listening to? First of all, the first thing, I love the word aspiration. We were aspirational. Why would we not be? I mean, why, why would you want to limit what you perceive as the potential in an idea? Or why would you, if you're going to form a band, why would you not want as many people who 
here as possible. Why would you not um, want to play all, all over the world? We had that kind of desire in us. It took us a long while to work out how it would happen, but you got to start with the aspiration. Otherwise, where are you? But I, uh, I was talking about this yesterday. There was something about that period. I, I mean, the question I was being asked, if you look at the social backdrop in that period, the early 80s and stuff, you know, a lot of the UK was in fire, you know, minor strikes, talks to Brixton, poll tax. Northern Ireland. You know, all of that. And we were all kids from, you know, a certain class. But at the same time, it wasn't that we were immune to that or it wasn't that we didn't think that was worthy of our attention. But there was just something going on, this desire to kind of create your own world, to invent yourself. And whether that was you invented yourself by forming a band or making a movie or becoming an actor or, or starting a magazine that's called The Face. A couple of years earlier when the whole punk thing let's call it explosion, a corny word, but in a way it works. Okay, that already seemed a long, long time ago. But I think in that explosion, when the walls came down, people believed, you know, we actually used the line in the song, Promise You a Miracle, anything is possible, everything is possible. And we believed in that. And I think that sense was coming through, perhaps in the music, it's that, yeah. that you're maybe pinpointing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and that album, obviously, uh, again, talking about influences, you know, Bono, I think, admits that, it, you know, it, it was a big influence on Unforgettable Fire. Yeah, that was really nice of him to say that. Really nice, because I, I love my guys, even the old guys. I still love them. And I felt sometimes they didn't get credit that they deserved. So that was really good. But as, as I was saying earlier, you know, I, I think we were all feeding off each yeah. other then and, yeah. and listening to the same records and so on. There was a moment, wasn't there, when sort of Simple Minds and you 2 were sort of mentioned in the same breath. And there was a, it was like, and yet looking back now, you're so completely different, apart from, I guess, the kind of Celtic and religious imagery. and Definitely. And I, I mean... I, I love this. I tell people this, this story where when you talk about <laughs> aspiration. So all my mates loved you 2 and my brother had got to see this band and stuff. I, Charlie and I had met them in this kind of bed and breakfast way, way back in Manchester. And remember that show, Lift Off with Aishia? Oh, with yeah, Aishia, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. I think someone will tell you differently, but I think that was you 2s first uh, appearance on British TV. Bowie's first appearance doing Ziggy Stardust. Apparently. Well, there you go. Sorry, Starman, Starman. Yeah, go, 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 go. <laughs> we were in Manchester uh, supporting magazine, I think, but we had already, a, you know, a couple of tracks out. And um, Charlie came up to me and said, that's, that's these young Irish guys. Young, we were only 18. There's these young Irish guys downstairs. And, you know, they love the band and stuff. Come and say hello to them. And I said, yeah, okay. And he said, but i got to tell you, They've got weird names, and, uh, <laughs> and I can't remember the fucking names. I, I, um, so, you know, just you introduce yourself. And I remember going down, and I mean, Larry, the drummer, he looked about 14 and mm -hmm. stuff. So anyway, we were always touring whenever I ever got to play with them until years later, but we watched their amazing success. And then so finally, we come to this as a sort of a double header and uh, Belgium Festival were on the first day we went on after them. And the second day they went on after us. I think they just had the great success with war in um, America. And they just they literally came back that day. And my brother, everyone said, this band's main boy. You know, this Jesus, good luck with them and all that stuff. So we stood at the side and we watched them. And they were really, really good. But it wasn't that good. <laughs> and we went on and just, um, you know, I was like Vox Amp and all like, what, what, what's this? We went on and it was just one of those days where everything worked right. The sun set during big sleep and all that stuff. And it was like, job done. Amazing. <laughs> so I didn't get the chance to talk to them that day. So next day, we went on first with Down a Storm. Job done again. And then I stood at the side. I give them a second chance. It's like one of the greatest things I'd ever seen. Of course, what, <laughs> what had happened was they just got off the plane. They were knackered. And 
they were really, really good, but they weren't like mind-blowingly good. I, but the next day, it was a long old drive back to the hotel that night. It was just tail yeah, between our yeah, legs. Yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah, and the greatest yeah. thing after talking to him afterwards, I actually became friends. And you know, if you remember that time, there was still the thing with the clash and all that, so bored with the USA mm -hmm. and anyone that was seen to be trying to break America, you know, persona non grata, you know, they're, they're the sellouts, all this stuff. Well, theirs was this band who had like really done it. And they were saying, you know, you should do it. You just do it. You know, just go for it. You should want to go. You just you have to tour and tour and tour. But really the thing I want to say, and it really sums them up even then, so when I tell people that story about the band and 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 um, I've seen them that night, people say, "Did you know then that they would become the biggest band in the world?" I said, "Yeah," and they say, "But how did you know?" And I say, "They told me." <laughs> <laughs> Bono is still telling people. <laughs> that's how. That's how. That's how confident they were. And I thought, I mean, people might make us saw that arrogant. I thought they were like yep. biggest band in the world. You should go for it as well. Jim, I thought it was fantastic. And so what you do, Jeb, what's amazing is that then for America, you could not be more in the centre of mainstream American culture than being in a John Hughes film. I don't know if you know the story of that guy because we turned that down like yeah, 19 we, times. Yep. Written for Brian Ferry. It's written for Brian Ferry because funnily enough, it was after that that I was working with Brian. That's why... He brought in Pat Leonard to write and record because he suddenly realised he turned down the big American hit. I think what must be hard for you is, you're, you know, you've been a, a, a band that writes all their own stuff and suddenly you're being given a song written by someone else, a great song, you know, is gonna, I mean, I heard the demo, the demo's out there on SoundCloud or YouTube or whatever. And that must have been a tough choice. Of course, yeah. it's one you're glad you made, but what went through your head? <laughs> You're right. For a band that did their own stuff, plus as well, you know, those days, NME and all that, credibility mm -hmm. was everything. You, you you know, we had created our whole thing and we were halfway through writing what would be our next album and we were excited by this thing we had up our sleeves called Alive and Kicking. And But what, what happened then, going back to record companies again, in this case, very unusual, record companies very rarely say we blew it. But the American record company came to us because they didn't promote New Gold Dream. They didn't promote Spark on the Rain. When I say promote, I'm talking Which about... Which is nuts when you think about it. It's nuts. They just didn't. Whereas we had success everywhere apart from there. But really there, it really was about the spend. Mm -hmm. And they weren't spending. And they came to us and they said, because college radio, all that, it had all happened. And they came and they said, look, I'm paraphrasing. We blew it. Your next record's going to work here. But it's some way off. We told them that we're only, and they said, "There's a buzz right now. There's this thing called the Breakfast Club, and there's this, you know, for you to be in that, it would keep that going, and blah 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 blah." And we were like, "Yeah, yeah, 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 great, 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 great." And they went, "Okay, we'll send you the song." And we went, "What song? What song?" <laughs> and they went, uh, "Oh, well, there's a song." And to make it worse, they said. <laughs> Talk about people being crass. This is a song. You really love it. It sounds just like Simple Minds. And, yeah. and um, which, you know, was like um, annoyed us even more. So we were like, no, nah, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. They sent us a film. Couldn't make head nor tail of it. Wasn't exactly Citizen Kane or The Godfather or, <laughs> or, or, or you know, well, it wasn't um, any of the arty films we would go and see. And um, He'd already done Pretty in Pink, and he? he was a sort of established teen film director yeah but we, we were Hughes. unaware of any of that absolutely unaware of that heard the song finally you know the there was one guy in a record company who had our ear and we liked him and he said listen to the song he sent it and to be fair i actually thought it sounded more like a psychedelic furs song which is as you see they already yeah. done song and i like the psychedelic furs but the thing more than anything was it just wasn't the kind of lyric i would write i would write do forget about me i wouldn't <laughs> This it just wasn't the kind of thing. So, and we thought well, we've got a live and kick him. We've got sanctify. We'll get all the things she said. We'll get you know. I mean, some movie. Who cares? And then what really made us jump was um, the writer producer Keith Forsey. Keith Forsey he was yeah. coming over to England. He, although he is English, he lived in the states. He was coming over to England, and the, the premise was. Um, 
Keith would like to come and say hello. You know, maybe you'll do something in the future and all that. And we were like, sure, you know, great. And he came. And, you know, it was like when your kids, you know, when your kids used to go to play and you meet someone and within two days they're your best mate. We just loved Keith. We loved his whole... And he was Giorgio Moroder's drummer. He? he was. He was. I mean, she's... Who then produced Ice House. So. And Billy Idol. Yeah. And Billy Idol. Yeah. And they were great, great records. But we already wanted to work with Jimmy Iovine. You know, Jimmy was yeah. Billy yeah, Idol and yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah, Love yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. But Jimmy worked with Patty Smith and Bruce Springsteen. and Yeah, Tom Petty. Tom Petty. I thought we'd learn a lot more. But the record company weren't wanting Jimmy. They were wanting Keith. Keith was a man, a man of the moment. Anyway, we loved Keith then rather cleverly. He said, like, you know, why don't give it a go and and um, doesn't work? It doesn't work. You get the record company off your back. And if it does work, um, who knows? So we went out for an afternoon, a studio near Wembley, and um, not to take away, because the song is the, the song, but Charlie came up with the intro, mailed the whole thing. We were trying to work out an end. We couldn't have an end. So they done this breakdown thing. I had no words. I sang this la 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 thing. And, you know, I'll write words to that. I'll come in tomorrow and do it again. Next day, they were like, no, 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 you're not touching that. Yeah, that's one of the great pop hooks. I think it smells full. If you're ever in, ever in a pub or whatever, well, it used to be anyway, probably you hear it in a pub, the whole pub. <laughs> Does Mel spill? <laughs> Did you ever get writing credit on Don't You Forget? They were so wanting to do it. They offered us some to publish them, and we said no. Right. <laughs> But no, it's the silence that the absolute silence at that point. <laughs> no, no, no. I think that's very, that's probably the right thing to do. And and and, and it was a geezer song. But yeah, it's yeah. you know, I looked yesterday. It's over half a billion plays on Spotify. Don't you forget about me? I mean, it's it, and it, no one's ever forgetting about it. As long as Keith gets them in, whenever you see him. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah, a geezer yeah. song. We weren't going to take that, even oh, if done. the la la yeah. la is the best thing about it. <laughs> um, um, I was just going to say something really impertinent, Jim, and I hope you don't mind which is uh, you were talking about not the sort of words you would write and in terms of what you write about. I've just had this random memory, which is years ago, Kirsty McCall, God rest her, told me that, yeah, told me that Book of Brilliant Things was about a porn mag. <laughs> <laughs> I hardly think so. But... Oh, good. <laughs> You know, you were talking about Alive and Kicking, obviously. You know, I remember hearing that when I was with Spandau. We were in Germany at the time and it came on. I mean, that's it. You know, that is one of the greatest songs. That's where you have to be now if you want to make music. I mean, that Once Upon a Time album. you got Jimmy Iovine, which I think is, a, you know, what a person to work with. You've never minded changing your producers, which is, I think, clever for you. You don't get stuck. You know, you've got fresh blood coming in all the time. But what I did look at and I saw is, you know, and this Bowie connection keeps going, Robin Clark, who sang on Young Americans, and Carlos Alomar, sing backing vocals on that album. And that sound of the backing vocals, that soulfulness, became a sort of signature for your sound at that moment. Yeah. All the producers we worked with, you know, we learned so much. In fact, we learned so much from sometimes that's why we changed after one record, because we were great at absorbing things. That's not to say they didn't have more to give, but we were so hungry to, okay, this guy's going to teach us this thing or this guy's going to teach us this thing. But with Jimmy looking at it, it was all songwriters. And I thought, we really want someone to put us under pressure song-wise because the previous album, Sparkle and the Rain, I think had, you know, there's some great vibey tracks, Waterfront, Look of Brilliant Things, Up on the Catwalk. Oh, I love that, love that. You get to say to the record, then the songs... The songs are just not... And I think, um, don't you forget about me, coming off the back of that, which was a classic American tune, you had to equal that, if not hmm. surpass it. Well, that was Jimmy's thing. You know, He every day he would mention it. We would be like, shut up. Out of interest, Jim, sorry, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but did he come to you or did you go to him? A great story about that as well. I'll go uh -huh. quickly this. I mean, Jimmy, I, I have been in, I have to say, as much as I'm praising them and talking about all these people that record companies weren't so keen on Jimmy. There was this whole thing of, well, Jimmy was a vibe merchant. He was good with the artist, but he wasn't, you know, technically and all that stuff, which was, I, it's wrong as we've seen, you know, he, whatever is needed, Jimmy will find. But 
the record company, I don't think we're putting it in the calls. And I had been trying to get in touch with, with Jimmy and he, he wasn't getting back to me. And Jimmy had gone down a great band, actually, Colin Hayes, fantastic men at work. You should get Colin Hay on your the Colin Hay's got the best stories. You'll, you'll, yeah, yeah. He's bloody yeah, hilarious yeah. As, as well. Anyway, CBS had sent Jimmy down to Australia to sort these Aussies out. You know, they this weird <laughs> band, that, that huge hit, and they weren't playing ball and they weren't listening to the Americans. And they sent Jimmy down. You know, Jimmy's a Brooklyn guy and tough and all that, even though he's a little guy, he's a tough nut and all that. But he bit off more than he can chew. He told me he got to Australia. The Aussies were like, fuck off, mate. You know, and he, he didn't even get he didn't even get in the room. So he tells me this. He says he, he's like, Great, I've been paid anyway, you know. I'm I can, I wanna go home. He gets in the taxi to go home a day later. And it is very Jimmy this. There's a young guy driving the taxi. What are you doing? All that. And Jimmy, you know, not slow and telling him he's a record producer. And, you know, who have you worked? I've worked with Springsteen and you too. And da, da, da. the way Jimmy told me, the kid went, um, yeah, well, this is my favorite band. And he put on Waterfront. Uh, Jimmy Ow. said, who's this? And he said, oh, simple means. Then Jimmy, no, oh, that's a band that's been trying to get in touch with me. Um, <laughs> Jimmy, no. that was Jimmy. But, by the time we worked with Jimmy, I mean, my record company hated us. You know, after Don't You, they said, you got to go with Keith, but we stuck with it with Jimmy. And Jimmy was saying, you got to have some, you know, it's number one. You're going to have to do something really special. So we had, from the very early, we were live and kicking the chords, the intro and all that. There was something magic about it. But Jimmy was really keen and making it as big an event and, you know, he loved Sly and the Family Stone and he loved all that. He loved that soul thing. And we obviously know now Jimmy's uh, re relation to black music and work on the vocals. Why don't you come up with a whole vocal canon thing? And I come up with that. And he said, well, who shall we get to sing? And as you mentioned, Gary, I remember Robin Clark and all those Philadelphia team. And I, I said, you know, we should get something like that. And Actually, I have to say, Jimmy, as with Trevor Horn later on, you say to them, we should get something like that. They go, let's just get the real deal. Yeah. And and that's yeah. how that um, came to the forefront. Yeah, yeah. You know, talking about Trevor and that album you did with him, and obviously this is a massive album for you. And I mean, you gave you your first UK number one as well with Belfast Boy. And it, you managed to drag him away from the cosy environs of Psalm up to your place in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. That must have been a battle. I don't know how it um, went down in America, actually, to be honest, Jim, but uh, musically, it it's a beautiful album. I mean, it yeah. is a stunning album. And that song is absolutely, you know, this is, you are the boys who've come all the way from, you know, doing Chelsea Girl to making Belfast Boy, which is a six minute piece of cinematic drama the yeah. thing is with trevor we all love trevor we've all worked with trevor yeah he's been on the show as well is he makes trevor's records he doesn't always just look after the band and if he doesn't like the drumming or if he doesn't like the bass player in that band he'll get someone else in yeah. and were you worried about your identity being lost or was it a moment of clarification where you went well it's just about me and charlie really and obviously um your keyboard player, Mick McNeil. No, I'll tell you what it was. When I look at Trevor now, I mean, and actually a huge, as you will also know, a huge part of Trevor's thing was Steve Lips. And, yeah. You know, Trevor with the imagination, Steve. Steve would say, like, you know, give me the bass. And you go, hang on a minute, the bass player's over. Like, give me the bass, do this. You know, try this. And it would be amazing. Such great ideas. I mean... I have to tell you, as much as there's, and we loved, and, and much of a lot of great stuff came out of that, the timing wasn't so good for us or them. And I'll explain why. <laughs> we realized about, well, not halfway through, but they wanted to work with us because they were kind of tired of their shtick. I think a lot of the acts they had worked with not you guys, Gary, but a lot of the acts they worked with, they did it all. And I'm going to say this being polite to the others, but yeah. they, they wanted to work with a real band and a band that could play live. And a, mm -hmm. I think they wanted to get away from the fair lights and the whole thing. They even wanted to get out of the studio, as you quite rightly uh, say, uh, Guy. they came up to Scotland. They, they were tired of the whole thing. Here's the catch. 
we were tired of our thing as well. <laughs> so we were kind of looking at him going, where's all the fair lights and all that? And where's Slave to the Rhythm? And where's... Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were going, where's the band? And, and where's... Um... By that time, our thing was starting to fragment. It had been 10, 11 years in, and, you know, people had bit of money and some options and some were more engaged than others depending on the day of the week we never looked at anyone to do the heavy lifting with us but i think although we wouldn't have admitted it at the time looking on it now i think we were looking for you know them to do the heavy lifting so as much as i like a lot of the stuff that came out of it i listened the other night to um if they had produced Waterfront, if they not to take anyway from Steve, Steve Lillywhite, but mm-hmm. if they had produced Up on the Catwalk, I, th- I think they would have taken it to another degree because, you know, I thought Waterfront was this big epic thing and then being down in New Zealand turning on the radio and hearing Welcome to the Pleasure Zone and thinking, geez, oh, I mean. Gary and I discussed this yesterday. The thing with what Steve brought to the party and what he didn't bring to the party is that is it Spark in the Rain is you've gone big, you've gone huge. This is a band who's clearly going out to play arenas. Yeah. But but it's taken away some of the colour. Yes, that is true. But I think, you know, we were we were bored with our thing. You say, well, that's natural. We were beginning to get bored with our thing. And, you know, we'd all love to think we're geniuses and all that, but you only have your thing and you can expand on it. But we were like, you know... What are we going to do here? But we did. I mean, where Trevor said, well, what are you going to do? Ever done a Celtic song? No, that'll never happen. That'll never work with us. Or, Why wouldn't it work? It's just not us. Trevor's got this thing. Whatever you shouldn't do is what you do. Yeah. He planted a seed. And from that seed, lo and behold, we have our own version of Stairway to Heaven. I heard Belfast Shell the other night. The way it starts, like that stairway to heaven, it starts with one thing, and then there's a big blow and Charlie mm. Solo. And can I also just blow my own trumpet and say maybe a little bit of through the barricades as well? There, well, there you go. Did you get stick for writing? Uh, well, I was worried about that. Writing a song about we got, um, we got a, about a place I didn't come from, you know, about Belfast. Yeah, I, I, but I remember the very first place we ever played that live was at Kings Hall in Belfast. And I just remember this guy was on top of his mate's shoulders and he was crying, singing the lyrics. Yeah. And I thought, it didn't matter. It worked. Well, I mean, why wouldn't you at some point? I mean, no, what would they call it now? Virtue signaling. No, no, no. But you've got Irish background. I've got Irish background as well. You know, it's it, we have a connection. We have family. Uh, absolutely. I mean, if you're only meant to write about the street you came from, it would be, um, they were the themes of our mm-hmm. time. At some point, if you're a writer, you're going to try, it. You, you know, surely. And also look at the people who influenced us. I mean, uh, you know, Peter Gabriel, uh, mm-hmm. Dylan Springsteen, gone way, way back. You know, you if you're a writer, you know, you're going to surely want to expand at some point point to and especially if you young persons obsessed with the issues of their time i want to talk about you and charlie as a relationship i mean yeah. you started this interview saying at one point you're in a bad place you'd gone through your second divorce i mean part of you must sort of be frustrated that it wasn't the same guys that got onto that club in glasgow in satellite city in 78 that it's changed so much which you know unlike a band like you two which still sort of clung together but you and Charlie, that relationship is so strong and it's longer than any marriage you've had, isn't it? I laugh when people use that marriage thing because I always go, marriage? We haven't slept with each other. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I, I was going to say, Charlie hasn't taken half my money, but actually he has. <laughs> and vice versa. So, no, Charlie, what can I say? I... I um, Growing up in Glasgow, growing up in the area we grew up in Glasgow, we loved our child. We grew up in the same housing estate. Where Charlie and I were born only a few miles from each other. We're, we're Gorbals families. We then moved to this place called Tory Glen, which was a new housing estate, tower blocks. And although those places have such a terrible rip, it seems every month some Glaswegian author will put out a novel about how awful oh, life right. was. Yeah, Damien Barr and then um, Deborah Orr and yeah. You know, 
everyone has their own story and their own take. I loved that tower block living. It was, to me, being up that high, it, it felt you could see the whole world. And more importantly, it felt there's a whole world out there. But of course, that was that was before little things like heroin came into Glasgow. And that was before real deindustrialization. People still had jobs, they still had a sense of pride. They still had, you know, their reason for being. So Charlie and I grew up in this, this housing scheme. We lived in the same street. His elder brothers, Jamie and John, they were the cool guys, you know, they had the doors, they had Dylan, they had they had all this stuff. And then at school, you see your, your tribe, you start to identify by who's carrying whatever records are under their sleeve. And, and Charlie and I always shared the same taste. I mean, whenever I asked you people, why does it work? We've got so much in common, but we're so different as well. And that stops it from being boring. And the other question people ask, I sense there's a bit of devilment in you guys. So it might, I might beat you at the punch here. Do we ever fight? Do we ever have a scrap? We have almighty scraps. We usually have one every, um, at least one every album and, and one every year. The great thing is once the scrap is over, it, it doesn't even get carried into the night. We're able to drop it. And usually the scrap is because it's out of frustration where the once or twice in a year where we're just not on the same page, we're not able to describe well to each other why someone sees something the other person doesn't see it. And then someone will just use the wrong word. Yeah. Well, domestics are never about the thing that they're about on the surface. Exactly. Side. Exactly. <laughs> but as, as long as you don't become simple mind. <laughs> yeah. God, God forbid. All the guys brought something, but listen, 40, Five years in, nearly. Yeah. Charlie is. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's music we're talking about. Was it music that brought you together originally, or was it before that? I mean, no, it was, I mean, the playground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were still building the the housing scheme that we moved into, and and you know, literally, we were moving in. Mum and Dad were moving in the furniture. Mum and Dad said, "Get out, go out and play." And <laughs> the street was still a building site. There was a huge sand castle cement castle and charlie was sitting at the top of it he was the king of the castle and uh <laughs> he, and he still is in there yeah, was ever that. yeah you know we can't go through every album this you've ever made i mean it's just your career is so expansive and it you know but it's it's remained with simple minds apart from i do want to mention lost boys I sent Guy one of the solo yeah. last, uh, one of the tracks last night that you you did with um, Townsend did a mix of it. What's his name? Um, Chenzo Townsend. Chenzo Townsend. Oh yeah, what a song that! It's so good. I loved that solo album. Charlie got married and had kids a wee bit later than me, so there was a period where you know the nineties for us it got really you know we were flatlining. By the end of the 90s, it really looked like, I mean, we've been kicked off record label, no publishing deal, no management, nothing. And I'm saying this as though, you know, poor us, but in our minds, we felt, I mean, sure, of course, we didn't like it, but sometimes, you know, well, maybe it's not meant to go forever. What's next? And there was a period of about two years where um, it could have gone either way. That's what took me to Sicily and actually... Sicily, not just in terms of life there. When I went down to Sicily, I was able to do that also because, you know, Charlie was taking care of all the other stuff in his life. But when I went down to Sicily, everyone there had a laptop and everyone was a DJ. And you'll know that Italian dance music and house music was a big, big thing for yeah. a period. I'm not doing that thing anymore. I don't do that. It's gone. I'm not here to do that. I don't want to know. I'm not that guy anymore. But I used to play football, five sides, and we would play the other towns and villages. And every game, somebody would come up and say, I've got my demo here with some of the Italian guys. Can you listen to it and stuff? And I'd go, no, you know, I, I don't do that anymore. What do you, and they'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what do you mean you're not you? Yeah, yeah. Who are you then? And I was, you know, I'm not doing that. And then there was one guy, he said, look, can you come down and help me with a lyrics English and all that and I went down and after sort of two and a half years hiatus I wrote this song and then oh that sounds pretty good and then the next day another song and then another song and before I knew it I thought maybe this is a solo record and it was really just to kind of um, see if the muscles were still working or 
try and get the thing going again. It definitely is. It's, it's a good, great sound. I actually remember feeling actually when you finally got back with Charlie and you made it, that big music was big such music, a great yeah. album that that was the comeback album for Simple Minds. Well, look, you know, the confidence and all that, you start to, um, i tell you what we didn't want to do. I said this, I've used that expression before. We didn't want to just go around like punch drunk boxers, you know, men out of time, just doing it because you don't know what else to do. Bless them. And also, bless us, we were fortunate. We'd been looked after. So it was like, if we're going to do this again, are we going to dedicate our whole lives to it? And the way you, when you're young, you don't have anything else in, in your life. But when you're older, you've been run the block a few times. You've got other options. You've done it. I love Steve Harley, and I was talking to him, and he asked me about you were comparing things. I, and I said, you find out a lot about yourself when you're in the money, when you're in the mini bus, not the money bus, the mini right. bus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> En route to a club gig that's not sold out and you pass a stadium that you did sell out. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and yeah. you really, you go, you'd really find out about yourself then. Yeah, I've done that. You know, yeah. and also at the same time, the voice, another voice in your head saying, well, what the fuck? No one owes you anything. What do you think? You think you're own something? Look at the guys who started this, all the blues guys, all those guys that never got paid a penny, never in any career, just done it. Are you doing this because, or are you doing it because it's your very fabric that you need to write, you need to play, you need to hear that sound coming out of speakers, regardless. And I think for us, we went, yeah, let's go with the second and, option and see where it goes. And for most of us, you know, there is that moment when we're the same age as our audience, when the ground swells up under our feet and we become giants and then it subsides. You know, the audience don't want to go to gigs every week. I mean, very few bands get the chance where they keep that going. You know, well, you two, we mentioned obviously the Stones, very few. Very, very few do. And, and how amazing. But apart from talent and I mean, as I say, no one owes you anything. If you had what we had even... Our tour starts next week. I was telling people, you yeah, know. Yeah, we are playing Wembley Arena. We shouldn't be complaining too much, should we? You did that very brave thing of doing the acoustic. That was so, mental, yeah. We yeah. never thought that would work. We've been asked to do that for a long time, and Charlie and I were like... Because why it's not something that springs to mind? Oh, do you know what? I'd really like to hear this with kind of all the stuff taken away. <laughs> <laughs> we called it bongos on the beach. Not fucking doing bongos on the beach next time. We? <laughs> and then, you know, we thought, that. Oh, we could probably make that work for about two songs, you know. How are we gonna get how are we gonna get a whole night out of it? That is great. Yeah. I loved it. it I loved great. it. I mean we cheated a wee bit. We had a few sequences going and all that. So it kind of it wasn't just Yeah, like, but I heard I heard you on Radio Two a couple of weeks ago doing Alive and Kicking with a small orchestra. That was you, great. You know, mate, you just you perform to whatever sound you need is behind you as a singer, you know, it's with, if it's loud you sing louder, but you you were absolutely brilliant. Jim, I mean, I've got to say good luck on this tour and uh, it's your big anniversary tour, is it? Or is it not really? It's 44 seems a bit weird. <laughs> it was meant, it was kind of meant to be. That was like three years ago before the whole COVID yeah, malarkey yeah, yeah. kicked yeah, in. Yeah. I mean, I think we're about 44 years in now. So, um, but goes without saying we're looking forward to it and um guy i think we should have a trip down there to see it i, I, I think I, we absolutely should have a trip down to see that i'd love to I've, I, I always see you in milan usually Jim, yeah, right we've bumped into each other in milan a few times one thing i think it's a shame we haven't got to talk about all the great musicians that have been around you know john giblin and and of course the wonderful sharice now who, amazing um, you yeah, know i told with, with sharice for a whole year with brian, he's drumming yeah. with you now send him my love we talk about the early days, and of course, the guys that worked on those records that we still live off, but mm. when you go on stage that night, right. you're there in, in the moment. It has to be a great band. And again, I can say this because I'm talking about the musicians. It's a hell of a band. It's a hell of a racket. And, and also visually as well. I mean, you know, I think you would agree. If Prince was still alive, Sharish would be in his band. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Bowie would have yeah. it in a second. Um, but also we got a great, great keyboard, Berenice. I mean, it's a hell of a band. Sorry, just one more thing, though. Just one more thing. Herbie Hancock, where did that oh, come yeah. from? Oh, yeah. yeah. How did Herbie Hancock end up on Hunter and the Hunted? It was a great one, again, because we were in the Townhouse studio, 
there was some American, I can't remember his name, some American guy who was keen on managing the band in the States. And he was in London at the time, and he also looked after Herbie Hancock. I'll drop by and see you. And uh, he brought Herbie Hancock in. And, and, I mean, it's the most unlikely thing, Herbie Hancock, with these Glaswegian. I mean, I'd be lying to say we all knew Herbie Hancock's track record. But, <laughs> but um, when you think about it, what I was saying earlier about people like Ivy and, and Trevor, who when they say, you know, I want this kind of thing, they go, get the real deal. Yeah. How about getting Lou Reed to sing on a track? I mean, that was really <laughs> yeah. something. So um, sometimes you get those magic moments where somebody's passing by. Now, what I wanted to say was uh, my 18-year-old self thanks you for the changeling and for inspiring me back when I was at, at that club in London. No, no, no. That club in London, it could have gone either way. That club in London, Rusty, you guys, Steve Strange, that club in London, it, it could have gone gone either way. We would have got ditched, that's for sure. Who knows if we would have got picked up. I was joking when I said earlier it costs us a fortune. In hindsight, compared to what happened either, it was pennies. But although being a Scotsman, <laughs> that thing gave us new life. Yeah, you knew you weren't the only ones. And who knows what would have happened. So, no, I, I we all use. Jim, I know you're a fan of the show. You've also probably made the record longest episode. Yeah. Which Have we I? Are, Is that oh, I'm one of these I'm, I'm frankly, guys? I, we, no, we, there's tons we haven't got to. Tons, tons. Well, no, I love Charlie. And I have to say, Charlie, yeah. you should get Charlie on. We are. Because yeah, yeah, absolutely. He very rarely does interviews. He loves your show. And I say, you know, these guys, when you hear them talking, you, you say, well, they, they, yeah, we would have been in the same bands if we'd been in mm. class at school and... Um, so it's kin. Oh. oh, thank you so much for coming on, Jim. Yeah. Beautiful. Really, really lovely. Really lovely to talk to you, Jim. Any team you want to see is absolutely welcome. By the way, Waterfront is going back in one of these days on the Sources Tour. Well, so. I'm going to come to. I've got to come to. Yes. When, when are you going back out? Next, Next month. month. Great. Um, yeah, but I'm sure we're, we'll pass. Yeah. We might pass. Yeah, we might not. All right, mate. Lots Great. of love. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. 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 It went by so fast and there was still so much to talk about. He's got so many stories. He's such a great gal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could just sit and listen to him all night. I didn't know whether we should be wrapping it up or whether, but it felt like it was kind of right. It was yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of right. I know the Simple Minds fans will be going, oh, what, what about that album? You never talked about that detail, you know, but... Um, well, I know, that's why I just jumped back in with the Herbie Hancock thing. I, sort of thought, you yeah. know, I mean, there's a million things we can get to, look, you know, but I think Jim's probably worthy of a part two, frankly. He's, going back to Keith Forsey and doing good news from the next yeah. world, all that sort of stuff. But I'm yeah. pretty sure our audience are going to love that one. Love him. Uh, yeah, listen, thank you. Guy, I've got to go. My dog's barking. Can you hear him? He's going crazy Yeah, no, there. I've got to go. I've got a gig. I've actually got a gig, so... Really? Who are you playing with? I'm just recording for a Swiss artist who I've worked with for years. Oh, very good. Very good. Yes. In- All right. Enjoy the Ferrero Rocher. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks to Ian and Ben, our producers, and keep it here. It's good night from me. And it's good night from them. Good night from them.